give you three minutes, two and a half minutes for prayer. I can.
about you, but I've had a rough three months. I, I think, you know, remember, do you remember your mom said, you're getting on my last nerve. And then, you know, there would be a red light go off, and, and you knew it was time to go visit your friend three blocks away. Yeah, well, uh, anyway, today we're talking about one more emotion, uh, managing something all of us have, and most of us uh, have moments where we don't handle them very well. You ever had a meltdown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe not even, it, it wasn't even public, but inside your life. Like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to see John Wayne. Any John Wayne fan? You remember McClintock? You remember when that sodbuster settler was uh, afraid somebody would run off with his daughter? And they did, but that's a true story. Uh, but, uh, and he's got that shotgun and he's poking John Wayne.
how to praise Jesus. All right, here they come. Watch out, Spidey. Hello, hello. How are you? It's good to see you guys. My goodness. Yeah, I get that excited when I get to go to church. Why? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. We're going to talk about my friend Spidey. What do you think? Spooter Man? I thought it was Spider Man. Really? How many of you like how many of you like Spider-Man? Oh, kind of. 50-50. Yeah, 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 yeah. Alright. So how's everybody's week going? Anything exciting? What'd you guys do this week? What'd you get? What'd you do? You slept on oh, day. <laughs> Woman after my own I'm heart. Right there. there. How about you? What'd you do? You got a new dog? What kind of dog? Ain't nothing but a hound dog. <laughs> That's wonderful. That is cool. So a hound dog chews on everything. You know that, right? So hide your good shoes. The ones you want to replace, leave them out. She already took your stuffed animal? Yeah, well, get used to it. Bribes work. Whether you realize it or not, your parents and grandparents are bribing. Anyway, we're not going to talk about dogs today too much. All right. Anybody else? What else did you do? What'd you do? You got a good dog? She's got a dog. You do have a dog. <laughs> really? Here. All right. We're going to talk today about our emotions. What's an emotion? Something you feel. Yeah. What do you think an emotion is? You know, the word emotion simply means energy in motion. So if somebody were to go, boo, what, what did you feel? Scared, scared or start? If you're a man, you're just startled. You don't get scared. We just, we're startled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it hurt your eardrum? Which one? Here, turn around. Boo. No, anyway. Um, all right. So what are some other emotions you feel? Mad. What makes you mad? That's a built-in. I give you that. Excited. Yeah, excited is another one. What makes you get excited? Your dog. There's a theme developing here. How about what? Oh, yeah, a squirrel. Yeah, or maybe a spider crawling under your arm. I was originally gonna bring a real tarantula, but I got all. Good job. Here you are. All right. 
Pass it around. Pass him around. Spidey wants to get to know it. She did. She died, you guys. I know it's because he's got like 100 batteries in there. You guys want to touch him? I know. I know. Oh, he's stuck. We have people back All right, so now listen, Captain Jack couldn't do that. He couldn't touch his fake spider because he really is very scared of spiders. So here's what I want you to know about your fears. God gives us fears and all of our emotions to help us. But sometimes our fears, our emotions get carried away. Has anybody ever get mad before? If you don't, think about what's making you mad. If you just act on your anger, then you're probably going to say something. join us. We're going to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And as you sing this song, think about what God has done for you in your life. Our salvation is such a gift from God.
Hallelujah. God is God and that is always enough. Please have a seat. of this country, Lord, to look to you in your direction. We lift up this church, Lord, and all that serve it, that you bless them. We just praise you and worship you, Lord. Please join me in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed try to pretend we're not, but we are. Uh, we just have testosterone to uh, combat that nasty feeling. Uh, feelings come from our thoughts. They're not the same thing as emotions. They're really not. Uh, you think about how someone rips you off and you become what? Angry. Well, of course you do. And emotions are deeper than that and they're, they're not filtered. You know, you have to think about getting angry and then you get angry. But you can get angry without really thinking about it. How many of you, if I went out there and just said, put your right hand out and hit your, your thumb with a hammer, would get angry? <laughs> would you have to think about it? No, no because it's an emotion. <laughs> they don't begin in your thoughts. Emotions originate as sensations in your body. Now, they can lead to the exact same reality, but they are different. And the problem with emotions, because they're not automatically filtered, is they can create emotion is that churning in your stomach when you walk into a party and you see your ex standing there. Yeah, you don't have to think about that. It's that giddiness you feel while you're falling in love. You don't have to say, you know, I should feel something right now. You just, you do. You just feel. It's an emotion. If you come across a dangerous animal in the woods, what's the only emotion that really makes sense? Fear. Fear drives us to act. You know, the old fight or flight, but also freeze or freak out. They all work. You just have to, you just respond wherever you're at. Lisa and I went camping in the Adirondack Mountains. Anybody ever been to Adirondack State Park in New York? Isn't that amazing? But you know what's not so amazing? If you're there with your girlfriend and uh, you're sleeping in a nylon tent, how sturdy and how, how safe are you in a nylon tent? So 
until about two o'clock in the morning, we hear this rustling outside, and, and I sleep heavy, so she wakes me up. There's somebody here, there's something outside the tent. I go, oh yeah, whatever. And then I hear it, and I'm like instantly awake. You know, it's like six cups of coffee in one breath. And uh, so I, I uh, we listen for a little bit, and I convince myself it's a bear. <laughs> and so all I've got is a flashlight and a hatchet. And so I try to act all manly and unzip the tent fly, you know. <laughs> and then I poke my head out and I shine the flashlight out around and the noise stops. And I go, oh, God, I scared them all. So I, I pull myself back in the tent, start, and then it comes back. Oh, no. So I, I get out of the tent and my knees are knocking. You guys, are, you know, this is a real thing, by the way. You know, my knees are knocking. I'm scared to death, and I'm trying to echo macho, you know, with my little flashlight and my little hatchet. You know? And I'm like, oh, God, just save me now. And uh, so then I looked over at the trash can, and it wasn't a grizzly bear, as I imagined. It was a raccoon. I went from peeing my pants to praising my Lord. <laughs> for prostate cancer, the VA has been giving me a drug called Eligard. Some of you know what that does to a man. It decreases your testosterone to zero, quite frankly, uh, because the testosterone feeds my prostate cancer. Um, it gives me hot flashes. I've had three this morning. People say, oh, you look good in your jacket. Put it on. I say, I can't. I'll soak through, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, but far worse than hot flashes for me is that I feel, I feel way too much. I like being a guy. You know, we're not pretending when you say, we don't care. <laughs> we don't. Until they give you Eligard, and you do. You care about everything. I've watched more Hallmark movies in the last <laughs> six months than I'd have seen in my entire lifetime. And they're pretty good, but they're very predictable. They really are. Lisa and I have had more long talks since we dated in 1978. Remember? I don't know how it was for you, but we met. It was, a, you know, the summer of 78 for us. It was like Greece, summer loving, da 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 And uh, so, but we used to talk all the time. And then like, we got married. We didn't have to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but that need has come back. And so is the need for touch, for touch. I got a serious question for you women. How the heck do you manage these emotions? <laughs> you know, my hero growing up was uh, Mr. Spock from Star Trek. He didn't feel nothing, man. <laughs> there are two realities. The first one is uh, I'm not in the program anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and there's now a social uh, SQ, but I'm not going to talk about that. IQ, everybody know what IQ is? So that's, that's a measure of your intelligence, right? Your intelligence quotient. All right? And uh, that can tell you a lot about somebody's capacity to, to memorize and to understand new information, process that information, make the right decisions. So IQ, a high IQ is good. You know, you don't want to get it too high because there are some people, people are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. But an EQ is an emotional quotient. You know, uh, it's this ability to function in the world as a social being. Um, as a pastor, I developed a very high IQ for a man. I'll, I'll give you that much. For a man, it was a pretty high EQ. Um, you know, empathy, perception, uh, that non-anxious presence when you're telling me you've just killed your dog with a hatchet. I don't know. You know uh, but, but here's the deal. I can't handle my new EQ score. I just, I, it's just it's off the charts. So Ephesians 4.26 has been important to me in the last oh, six months, really. Read it with me. Don't let the passion of your emotions. Now, stop right there. Passion just means that you really feel it. I mean, it's there. It's pressing. You can't deny it. You can pretend to deny it. But if you do so, that, that energy in motion is still there. 
So what happens if you try to stop a, a car doing 60 mile an hour by stepping out and saying stop? Yeah, yeah, most of you are too smart for that. You have a high EQ or IQ. But some of you try to do that with your emotions. You think that you can just say stop. And the truth is, sometimes you can will things to stop for a time. But it really is energy in motion. And you've got to ground that emotion or divert that emotion. You have to express and feel that emotion. He says, don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to what? To act out in ways that harm you or harm others. So don't let anger, he's just going to pick on one here, so, but it applies to all the emotions. Don't let anger control you or be fuel for what? Revenge. Does revenge just happen? No. You have to think about how somebody hurts you. Now, the, the, the emotional part, maybe you get angry because whatever, but you're, you generate a, a plan, a plot to cause harm to another human being. That's what happens when your emotions remain unacknowledged and unchecked and ungrounded is you will act out on those emotions. And if you don't do it in a positive way, you're going to do it how? Very negative way, okay? Revenge on others, revenge on yourself, you know? Uh, so this is in the traditional translation. It says, not even for a day. Don't let the sun set on your anger. So lay aside what? Bitter words. And you know the hardest bitter words to lay aside are the ones that took you two hours to think up. Oh, wait till I see you the next time. Anybody still have temper tantrums? I'm going to check with your spouse, okay? So revenge, profanity, and insults. It goes on and says this. Read it with me. But instead, be kind and affectionate. In other words, you've got that energy, that emotional energy, and it has to be expressed. But don't express it negatively. You know, the greatest victory is victory over self. So you're feeling it. You're experiencing it. Is there a way to channel it in such a way that you can choose to be kind and maybe not say anything, maybe not respond anyway, and even move it up a notch like Emerald. Bam, kick it up a notch. Be affectionate. It's not saying, you know, like it all lovey-dovey with your enemy, but it is saying you care about them. Does that make sense? It's not my idea. It's the, the idea of the Christ. We are to love our neighbor and our and are, I knew you'd get there eventually. I was running out of breadcrumbs, though, to be honest. So he's asked this question, and I want you to listen to the question and respond yes or no. Has God graciously forgiven you? Yes. yes. Some of you say, well, I, I don't feel it. I don't remember it. Trust me. The fact that you're not an ink spot based on what you did and what I did tells you that God has forgiven you. Then graciously do what? Forgive, Forgive one another in the depths of? In other words, with everything you can muster, forgive. You need to understand forgiveness, though. Forgiveness isn't like getting them off the hook. Forgiveness is saying, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to exact revenge. All those things we said we weren't going to do. Instead, in our forgiveness, we're going to be kind and affectionate. We're going to express the love for an enemy, which isn't kissy, lovey-dovey stuff. What it is, is working actively for their better or for their greater good, okay? Is it hard to work for the greater good of somebody who's harmed you? Absolutely. And yet, that is one of the great trophies of grace for the Christian. John Maxwell uh, once said, the leader's greatest victory is victory over self. John Maxwell was a Christian and a great leader. He really was, and, and trainer of leaders. I've been to probably a dozen of his seminars. Uh, but for the Christian, we've got to manage our emotions. If you want to lead anyone, you've got to start by leading yourself. One area every Christian, not every human, not just Christians, must learn to master is our emotions. And here's why. The quality of your life, the quality of your family life, the quality of your friendships is directly linked to your emotions. We all experience ups and downs. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a life marked by joy, love, peace, and passion is an amazing life. It just is. It can't stay on that high all the time, but if that generally marks your life, you've got a good life. But someone who's dominated by hate, sorrow, depression, anger, anxiety, the truth is they have a tough life. And do those emotions expressed negatively make it tougher or easier? Tougher for themselves and who? Everyone else. 
emotions are neither really negative or positive. They're just energy that has appeared in your body and you have to do something with it. The truth is your emotions and my emotions are complex and unpredictable. Proverbs 4, 23 says it this way. Read it with me. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So now he's not talking about wearing a you know, breastplate of righteousness, you know, putting a you know, quarter-inch steel plate over your heart. You'll never get through airport security. Come on, folks. But he's talking about guarding your character. He's talking about uh, you know, paying attention to that energy in your body. And you need to be able to filter it because emotions essentially are unfiltered energy. And so it takes a little bit of time to learn how to guard your heart. And according to the Bible, the primary way you do that is by feeding and training and shaping your mind. Here's where that comes from, Romans 2.12. Read it with me. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Stop right there. The world says you have a right to be angry. You have a right to get even. You have a right to hold a grudge. You have a right. And you fill in the rest of the blanks, especially the blanks that you fill in when you leave church today. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed. I, the kids are gone or we'd have a conversation about transformers. They're pretty cool. They really are. But be transformed by what? Renewing of your mind. You have some old thoughts. You have some old feelings that are stored as memories that need to be transformed. You just do. How do I know that? Because you're breathing and you're human. Okay? Once you allow God to renew your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Is Read it with me. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Somebody hurts you. Is there, are they a bad person? They could be. But what if God intends for that hurt to bring a greater good? A good that could not come about in any way. So it depends on whether you're looking at it from a human perspective or from God's perspective. What you'll see and what you'll experience. What you'll hear and how you will feel. So when you feel those things, you must think what you think. And you must feel what you feel. But when you do that, you need to take that emotional energy and filter it through your mind where the Holy Spirit can say, sit down, let's have a conversation about what you're experiencing right now. The truth is, emotions are always present, except when? When you're dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so suppressing or ignoring your emotions uh, can lead to really toxic behaviors. It, they just can, okay? And many of us do. None of us are Mr. Spock, and even Mr. Spock in the later episodes in the films figured out he had emotions, okay? Um, but when you ignore them, when you bury them, you are going to create toxic situations in your spirit and in your mental health. You are. That's just the way we're wired. Sigmund Freud said, unexpressed emotions will never die. They are buried alive and will come forth later in ugly ways. Do you believe that? I've lived that. I am living that. It is just so true. In 1978, I went to the United States Air Force, and Lisa went to Ball State University, also known as Party U. <laughs> Got the picture? And as I left for the United States Air Force, Lisa just told me that she decided she was going to date in college. Yeah. You think that made me feel good or bad? But the truth is, I wasn't honest with those emotions. I mean, we had a conversation. She knew I was angry, but she didn't really understand where the anger was coming from. And uh, so we just buried it. We did. But recently, like a Stephen King horror movie, uh, those emotions, those buried emotions, crawled out of our past. And after a 40-year amazing marriage, it threatened to cause it to collapse. We've been struggling for three months. We're talking through those feelings and trying to understand one another better. And I've told Lisa, and I tell you, not to make you a voyeur into our issue, but to give you hope. If you've been in a, a roommate situation in your marriage for a long time, if you love each other but aren't in love with each other anymore, there's hope. The stuff that you haven't talked about, the stuff you're afraid to talk about, 
uh, is preventing you from being honest. It's preventing you from being present in your marriage. It affects not only your spouse, it affects your children. It affects every role that you play since who you are as a spouse is central, only secondary to who you are in Christ. So here's what I want you to see. I love this picture. Yeah, Lisa's on top. Yeah. That's me in 1980. I was T.D. Wyatt Wright Pat, and I rode my motorcycle over to Ball State because uh, I was chasing the dream. I was. The truth is, uh, I was a visiting team, and there was an awful lot of players on the home team. <laughs> but you know what happened? By God's grace, I won! <laughs> Emotions just are. They just are. But what you do with them will determine the quality of your life, will determine that will either open new possibilities or close down avenues that would have been prosperous. It's not true just in your love life. It's true in your friendships. It's true in your, your uh, business, your career, your job. You've got to learn to be honest with your emotions, first with yourself and then with others, and share those things in such a way that it doesn't cause too much damage. You know, we have a marriage club that we recently started, and we are going through the five love languages. Uh, you may not understand it, and we'll do it very quickly, but um, everybody has a primary love language, and we don't all speak the same love language. Some of us, uh, if somebody says they love us and they don't spend any time with us, then we don't think they love us. Or if they say they love us and they don't help us with the dishes or the vacuuming uh, or mowing the lawn... <laughs> then we don't think they really love us. Or maybe it's words of affirmation. You know, if they don't notice that you've got a haircut or you brushed your teeth for the first time in a week, you know. <laughs> and some really need gifts, and it's usually not the size of the gift. You don't have to give them a brand new C8 Corvette. One rose will do, and they feel appreciated. You're filling their love tank. And then most of us, at some level, need physical touch. If you try to convince a child you love them and never touch them, guess what? They don't, they don't believe you, and neither does an adult. So in addition to the five love languages, expressing love in a way that you're, you're not just your spouse, but your family, your friends, your coworkers, not in a creepy way, but you need to let them know that you appreciate them, right? In addition to the love languages, you have five languages for an apology. How many of you think you married or have a friend that's a really good apologizer? All right, mine was for illustrative purposes only. <laughs> you probably noticed Lisa didn't raise her hand. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the languages are there. You can read them. And uh, I would encourage you, if you want to know more about this, get in contact with me and I'll walk you through uh, some, some really simple tools you can discover and then teach one another your, your apology languages. Uh, but Lisa and I, while we are the same in our love languages, we are polar opposites in our apology languages. We've been married 40, almost 41 years. That means she never heard me apologize. <laughs> and I never heard her apologize. Do you see the problem in this? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's true. Again, it's not just at home. It's true with neighborhoods. It's true with churches. It's true in governments. It's true in businesses. Because every relationship that's sustained more than two minutes has rubbing points. Because we can't always agree with one another. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So there you go. You proved my point. <laughs> ah. Matthew 5 4. Ario Speedrag. Anybody remember them? Yeah. They had a great song. You can't fight this feeling. I can't. Remember that song? I can't fight this feeling anymore. Anyway, uh, I don't have a guitar, just an air guitar up here. Uh, but read Matthew 5, 4 with me. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If you don't mourn, if you hide your emotions, can anybody comfort you? No. So it's not just for mourning. You're blessed when you feel all of your emotions and express them in a healthy way. Deal with them appropriately. Feel and deal. You can remember that much. Say it with me. Feel and deal. Ask yourself... How do we do that? 
That's what we're going to spend the next, I don't know, five minutes on. The truth is you can't fight your feelings. We all try it. At the end of the day, you wear yourself out or you bury them like I did on something very, very important to me. So you can't fight your feeling, but you can tame it. You can tame it. It's in your Bible. It's a, it's a, it works. The first step is what? Read it with me. Acknowledge them. To who? Start there, but acknowledge it to who next? To God. To God. And God will give you wisdom and insight whether that is the right time and the right place and the right person to share it with. Is everybody in your life that has hurt you, is every one of those people a safe person? No. So sometimes it's going to be between you and God, and you just have to let that feeling go. Read it with me, 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties on him. Him who? That's right, the Lord. Because he what? Cares for you. You know, the Bible also says, do not cast your pearls before the swine. Do you remember the reason the Bible gives? Because they will uh, turn and attack you and trample your pearls. And then not only were you hurt the first time, you're hurt the second time. So be careful. There's a version of Christianity that uh, is just very toxic when it comes to forgiving. I'm teaching you the biblical way. Um, You've got to acknowledge your feelings. You just do. But acknowledge them to yourself and acknowledge them to your Lord. Prayer is your number one strategy. You know, uh, you know, my wife, uh, I recently am wrestling with another thing. I, you know, things come in threes, have you noticed? So I'm waiting for the third shoe to drop, frankly. Um, but, uh, and she's, you know, my, my lovely wife, who's a very spiritually mature person, she says, you know, have you prayed about it? <laughs> and I'm thinking, if I tell her the truth, <laughs> I hadn't. And so it's starting to really weigh me down. And you know what happened once I did pray about it? I started feeling better. Didn't fix it. Can't be fixed. But now it's not just me trying to wrestle with that reality. It's me and the Lord wrestling with it together. This stuff works. It works for you and not just me. It's not a one and done, by the way. If you think it's that, then you're in the wrong place. You need to be in a bar, okay? (laughs) So first thing, you want to acknowledge your feelings, and then you've got to accept them. Sometimes that's really hard. You, you don't have to agree with your feelings, just like you don't have to agree with somebody you're disagreeing with, but you have to accept that that's how they see it. That's how they feel about it. That's how they think about it. And if you continue to beat yourself up and beat them up, uh, you're not going to come to a place of reconciliation. There is a peace that passes understanding. Have you heard that before? And it comes at this point. It's called acceptance. And this is one of the hardest teachings in this area So we're going to spend just a few minutes on it because most of us will reject this biblical truth out of hand. So read with me 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 5. Everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So what does that mean to you? Come on, this is an adult study. This isn't Sunday school. Yeah, yeah, but love in a practical way, right? Or love the person that's hurt you. Let's back away from enemy and just say somebody's hurt you. (laughs) Yeah, throw Reagan in there, love but verify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But here's the deal. Your emotions, some of you are raised with the idea that anger is always wrong. There's no excuse for it. You know, it's like Kenny Rogers' song, The Coward of the County. His dad made him promise never to lose his anger. Do you remember the end of the song? He does finally lose his temper. Do you remember that? Here's the deal. If you don't acknowledge and accept your emotions, when you recognize them, when you begin to feel them, then it gets harder and harder down the road. So everything created by God is good. Did God create all of your emotions? How about the emotion of disgust? How about the emotion of fear? So it is good and nothing is to be rejected. In other words, don't pretend you're not feeling it. Don't pretend you're not thinking it. Don't pretend that it's not who you are in that moment. It doesn't mean that's who you have to be the rest of your life, but recognize who you are in that moment. And don't reject that feeling. You may not like it. You may have been taught that you weren't supposed to express it. You weren't supposed to feel it because that would make you a less than Christian. Friends, God made you to feel your emotions. And here's the deal. It's got a conditional clause in there, if. 
If you can receive it with thanksgiving, if you can say something like this, Lord, I feel terrible. I don't like the way I'm thinking. The truth is, I know I'm being short-sighted here. I need you to broaden my understanding of this person, of this issue. And then you do what you, what you have trained yourself to do, I hope, in your prayer. You don't come to the Lord demanding that he change the universe so you feel better. You come to the Lord with an open heart and an open mind and an open wound. And you say, Father, I know that you're going to fix this. I don't know how, but I want to thank you. And I look forward to seeing how you take care of this because I can't. And that's how it's made holy. That's how it moves from being that horrible ick in your soul. That thought that runs through your mind night after night and keeps you from sleeping. That, that, that burning sensation in your heart where you just can't fix it and you can't accept it. That too can be made holy. That can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It can be dedicated to the Lord by the word of God. Don't compromise what God has said is right because you feel wrong. And make sure you pray about it. So you have to acknowledge them and accept them. And the third thing is this. How many of you ever forget to breathe? Here's the trick. And it's not just a, it is in your Bible, obviously. Read it with me, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Everybody hold your breath. Trust me. Trust me. Hold your breath. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. That's as far as I'm going. You can breathe again. <laughs> you can't control your breathing. Even when the rest of your world is out of control, even when you can't keep the thoughts from coming back time and time again, even when you can't label the emotions, you just feel them, you can't control all of your life, but you can control your breathing. God did not give us a sense of fear to be afraid of what we know we've got to think, to be afraid of what we know we must feel our way through. Through the Holy Spirit, he has given us the power and love, love of ourselves. Some of you loathe yourself. Some of you have done things that you just can't forgive yourself for. Some of you are so broken, you think that there's something that happened to you that cannot possibly be fixed, redeemed, restored, renewed. I want to tell you that's a lie from the pit of hell. God has given you the power of love, and love conquers all things. But when you feel like you're just completely out of control, breathe. Breathe. Count your breaths. And if you want to, you can breathe, you know, 1,001. Let's practice this. I'm going to say breathe in, and you're going to do it audibly. Ready? One, two, three. Breathe. Exhale. Breathe. Exhale. Some of you are getting lightheaded, I know. You haven't really breathed in a long time, but, but, but do you feel, if you do that for a while, you will feel a sense of self. You come back into the moment. In addition to breathing, I'll say things like this to myself. That was then. This is now. I'm not that person. I'm who I am today. They are not that person. They are who they are today. And then I breathe in and out a few more times. I'm not asking you to do transcendental meditation, but I'm asking you to do biblical meditation. If you can worry, you can meditate. The difference is when you worry, it's a negative thought. And when you meditate, it's a positive thought based on God's word. The last thing is this. You can't control your emotions. You need to express them. In positive ways. Read it with me. Ephesians 4.26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Oh my gosh, this is such an important lesson, Christian. Emotions need release. And they will find release one way or the other. Either when it was appropriate back then or 40 years later. 
You need to express your emotions. You've got to find healthy ways to let them out. Cry if you're sad. And if you're a guy and you don't want anybody to see you cry, go out to the beach. But cry. Or scream into a pillow as loud as you can until your vocal cords hurt. Scream into a pillow if you're angry. But avoid directing your emotions towards others. No matter, even if you're Satan is convincing you it'll make it better, the truth is it won't. You may be feel better for a moment, but then you've dug another inch or two in the, the trench that you're living in. What's the difference between a, 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 a rut and a, a, a grave? <laughs> yeah, a, rut, a rut goes somewhere, a grave, it's just over. Some of you have been burying your emotions, ignoring your emotions for so long that you're no longer in a rut. You're just in a grave. You need to begin to let the Lord fill in that hole. So in your anger, do not sin. But it's not just anger. In your fear, do not sin. In your sadness, do not sin. In your happiness, do not sin. In your disgust, your anxiety, your shame, your love, your lust, do not sin. Don't put off dealing with it. Deal with it before the sun sets today. Author uh, Robert Kiyosaki, there you go, said, emotions are what makes us human. Emotions are what makes us real. The word emotion really is just energy and motion. Be truthful about your emotions and use your mind and emotions in your favor and not against yourself or others. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm an emotional person. Some of you need to look back and say, well, really, truthfully, I'm a red-hot mess. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we recognize that you have created us as emotional beings. The emotions are neither positive nor negative, but the way we express them can be helpful or very hurtful. We can harm not just others, but ourselves and even our relationship with you. Father, we do ask you to fill in the rut to begin to fill in the grave and raise us to life again so that we can laugh like a child, so that we can look at others without guilt or shame or fear or anger and just say, you know what? All of that stuff is in the past, and who you are to me today is something that is precious. Father, give us the strength and the courage to simply live our life, feeling our way to heaven together. And all God's kids said, amen. amen. All right, if you would stand, our team will come up and lead us in our closing song. Oh, yeah. Are we ready to shout to the Lord? Yeah. Almost. <laughs> 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 well, I made sure they did, Gordon. <laughs>
seated. The next steps are going to be a little longer, but not too much. I promise not too, too much. Hey, how's everybody? Good, good, good. So there's a couple of things that I want to tell you about. Um, first of all, through our Lenten journey, these next 40 days, this is the first Sunday in Lent. Everybody knows that, right? Ash Wednesday started. So we have these Lenten prayer cards that are out in the cafe. They're in little, uh, boxes like this. And um, so praying through Lent is such a privilege, and these cards will help focus your prayers. Please take one, two, or however many you wish. That doesn't mean the box, folks. <laughs> Inside are the cards, okay? Each box is numbered, and on the back of each card is the corresponding number. What we'd like you to do is take one, two, three, however many you like of those cards out of the box, take them home, and pray with them for the week. When you bring them back next Sunday, initial them and return them to their box so that someone else can pray for them, and then take some more. By Easter, it will have been our privilege as a church to have prayed every prayer. This one says, this is my favorite, prayers for people you do not want to pray for. <laughs> Anybody have one of those, or six? Yes. We, there are many, many headings. You'll see that. We, are, we also gave some to the uh, Sunday school, and the kids have some for prayers for kids. So that is something that we hope you will do throughout this Lenten journey um, because prayer is so important. It is the conversation with God. And some of us don't really know how to pray, so these are great guides to start that. Uh, also, today, 1015, there's a charge conference to address um, Pastor Jerry's salary. Salary. There we go. Salary. salary. You know Not salary. Salary. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then raise the roof, capital fund kickoff dinner. That's in here, all the details. You need to do that. We're gonna we need a new roof, guys. So we need to raise the roof. Remember that guys? Like raise the roof. Yeah, we need to do that here. And finally, Pastor Jerry has an invitation. All right. Uh, this uh, is it Good Friday? Monday Thursday. Monday Thursday. Monday Thursday. We are gonna do uh, Da Vinci's Last Supper. What I need is I'm going to ask 12 men. Uh, you don't have to be an actor. We'll dress you up, make you look goofy. But other than that, it's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll put your part on a card. And the idea is uh, we'll have 12 disciples plus Jesus. And then uh, 
he'll, he'll stand in a, a frozen position as if he were looking at Da Vinci's Last Supper. And then we'll go one person at a time, and the spotlight will come on, and that person will come to life and, and do their part. They're very short parts, but it's a very meaningful service. And uh, so I would like uh, for the men of the church, uh, we're not going to do the revised version. Uh, they, they were men at the Last Supper. So uh, the men of the church come forward and, and put your name in the hat. And then uh, I would like pretty much everybody to volunteer. And then um, we'll see who, who can make the, the, the re- there'll only be one rehearsal, okay? Is, do you have your, your assignment, men? Step up, step so up. So come on up. up. So all right. There, Chuck's uh, raising his hand all the way in the back. Come on up. I don't up. want you to come, come up on. and give your name to pastor. Come on up. Come on up. Stand up and give him all your right. name. All right, and the rest of y'all. You can go home, or better yet, go get no, your No, you got to wait. <laughs> 10, 15, you can oh, go yeah, home 10, after 15. that. 10, 15, don't forget that. <laughs> yeah, if you're a member of the church, you can vote in the church conference, church conference, and you have to sign in in the, lo- ahead, in the uh, cafe. Come on up. It is Palm Sunday, or no, uh, no Monday, Monday, Thursday, Thursday. which is the Thursday before Easter. That's okay. Well, then you'll probably be the best. The uh, Monday Thursday service is usually about six. It's six, right? Yeah. It'll last about 45 minutes. It's a very meaningful service. It really is. Thanks, guys. Just sign it, John Hancock. <laughs> Works for me. We'll make sure he is uh, the tallest disciple. 